All right, a couple of instructions. We are embarking on a 16 week trek through the book of Genesis. If you're registered, you get a, a packet from Eric. So make sure if you're registered that you get that. If not, you are what in uh, academic parlance would be called an audit student. That is, you sit in here and you get the same material. It's just like Sunday school. The difference being you don't have to take tests. Sound like a good deal to me. You don't have to compose anything. You don't have to turn in anything. You just sit here and enjoy yourself. And I hope that it is an enjoyable experience. All right, Genesis. Genesis, as I'm sure most everybody knows, is the book of beginnings. It's normal to start out an exercise like this with an introduction. I hate introductions. Introductions are a necessary evil. I prefer to move quickly to the narrative, always have, but unfortunately, most every course is formatted so that it has an introduction. And after we get airborne, it'll be a good bit more palatable to me, and I hope to you. But this is something that we have to wade through in order to lay the groundwork here for the study of the book. And by the way, whenever I'm uh, doing anything and somebody, whether it be an, a doctor operating on me or whatever, I want to know his credentials. I don't want to know that he finished last in his class in medical school and the procedure that he's doing on me. And so I've taught this 23 times. This will be 24, going through the book of Genesis. It was something that I taught when I was teaching at Baptist Bible College for 20 years in Springfield, and I've taught it uh, two or three times since. So I'm not a novice exactly. As a matter of fact, my concentration when I was working on my doctor's degree was Old Testament exposition. So uh, whether I sound like it or not, I have been exposed. All right, here are some need to know facts which is really the purpose of an introduction. In modern church history, the Genesis account was the primary beachhood of the attack on the plenary verbal inspiration position long held before the modern rationalistic position spawned in Germany took hold in the mid 19th century. And once Genesis was questioned, this uh, critical apparatus was applied then to quickly to the rest of the Bible. You go from Genesis to a couple of Isaiahs, then three Isaiahs, then four Isaiahs. Then they moved into the New Testament and the miracles of Jesus came under the gun. And then of course, uh, the book of the Revelation doesn't belong there. And some of the canonicity of the books was questioned. So Genesis is very important. It lays the groundwork for the rest of the book. Now this initial attack on Genesis was called the JEDP theory. JEDP. That stands for something. It's also known as the Graf Wellhausen theory. Now why use the initials? Because they divided the book up, the book of Genesis, by how the author treated the name of God. And therefore, we have in the Torah, the number one book, the book of the law, it was added to and changed by an Elohistic writer, a Jehovistic writer, a Deuteronomic editor, and then some priestly emenders coming down near the captivity. So you don't really have what was initially there even, it's all been changed and jumbled up and after the captivity, something came out that was then known as scripture. Now to accept this tripe, dozens of New Testament references have to be discounted, 
amended, expunged, including the clear pronouncement of Jesus Christ on several occasions. Matthew 19, 4 through 6 and 24, 37 through 39. The clearest probably is John 1, 17, which reads, for the law was given by Moses. That seems pretty clear, doesn't it? Who wrote it? For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, how do they get around that? The accommodation theory. Either Christ didn't know exactly what happened, it was part of his limited knowledge that he took upon himself, or he was accommodating himself to the ignorance of the hour, of the day. He knew they believed that, and he didn't want to take time going through and unraveling all this. It was too complicated, so he just went with it, what they believed. But it says, given by Moses, not from J, E, D, or P. Now, one of the primary pushers of this idea is Bruce Metzger of New Oxford Annotated Bible fame. A divine who is supposed to be the high priest or final word for a generation, speaking from his tower at Princeton Theological Seminary. Metzger is typical of a host of theological institutions and Bible department faculties and history department heads at major universities, which sometimes they offer a fair amount of truth, but almost always mixed with a fatal portion of error. Listen to Metzger on how the Old Testament came to be. The Old Testament may be described as the literary expression of the religious life of ancient Israel. All right. The Israelites were more history conscious than any other people in the ancient world. Well, that's true as far as it goes. Then he falls off the wagon. Probably. As early as the time of David and Solomon, out of the matrix of myth, legend, and history, there had appeared the earliest written form of the story of the account, which was later modified in form to become a part of scripture. But it was to be a long process a long time before the idea of scripture arose and the Old Testament took its present form. The process, key word, by which the Jews became the people of the book was gradual. And the development is shrouded in the mists of history and tradition. Translation, shrouded, whenever you see something like that. We don't know what happened, and we don't have a clue, so we'll just say it was shrouded. The date of the final compilation of the Pentateuch, or law, which was the first corpus of the larger body of literature that came to be regarded by the Jews as authoritative scripture, is uncertain. Although some have conservatively dated it at the time of the exile in the sixth century. Well, Chronologists, Bible teachers, from Usher to Ruckman, push it to 15 to 1700 BC. A little difference. Who's right? Usually a liberal will try to make a thing smaller or shorter or less lengthy. And that's how they operate. Before the adoption of the Pentateuch as the law of Moses, there had been compiled and edited in the spirit and diction of the Deuteronomic school, the group of books consisting of Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings in much its present form. Originally, of course, it was not so highly regarded as scripture. It kind of grew into becoming scripture. Thus, the Pentateuch took shape over a long period of time. Okay, that is a representation of the 
rationalists, the modern liberals that you'll find almost everywhere. Now, the canonical placement of the book of Genesis. As has been mentioned, it is part of the Pentateuch. Pentateuch, Penta, five. Pentagon, five-sided building. Uh, Pentathlon, no longer contested, but it was part of the Olympics at one time. Five events grew into a decathlon or 10 events. The Jews call the compilation the five-fifths of the law, literally, the five-fifths of the law or instruction. Examples Jesus did in Matthew 5, 17. Stephen refers to it as such in Acts 7, 53. Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 8. The Metzgerites say the Pentateuch, the mixture of myth and legend and history, is a record of the evolution of the religious philosophy of Israel as it moved from a view of God as a tribal deity to a universal God under the later prophets. What do we believe? <clears throat> For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Or is it fable? Hmm, is Peter right or is Metzger right? When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now an eyewitness in historical parlance is called a primary source. To be a primary source, you had to be there. And they were there. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard. They heard the voice of God. If you heard the voice of God, that would rank pretty high, wouldn't it? As an authenticating source when we were with him in the holy mount, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Now, wait a minute. More sure than the voice of God that you audibly heard? Now, of course, you can mix it up after a while. Your memory can fail you. There can be some problems if you try to pass it on to someone else. But if it's written, hey, it's pretty easy to authenticate, isn't it? Wherein ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Peter, I think here is talking about the church age, that time before Jesus comes, until the day dawn. I would point to the watches of the New Testament. And the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that the prophecy of the scripture, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, borne along by the Holy Ghost. Now one alleged problem in Moses being the author of the Pentateuch. Deuteronomy 34, 5. And if you get into a discussion with a liberal, he's gonna bring this up. He didn't author the whole thing. Well, why didn't he? Because he couldn't. The poet wrote on Nebo's lonely mountain on this side Jordan's wave in a vale in the land of Moab there lies a lonely grave. And no man saw that sepulcher. No man saw it ere. For the angels of God upturned the sod and laid the dead man there. And it goes on. Why could he have not recorded the whole thing? Because he was dead during part of it. He was dead. This is the argument of a rascal. Because at the end, someone added just a little bit. Well, we can claim that Moses isn't the author. 
you are a rascal if you retreat there. The purpose of the Pentateuch, which would of course include Genesis. First of all, to establish guilt. To establish guilt. Romans chapter three. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Target audience, not you for the particulars, who are under the law. Dr. Samuel Johnson, I believe, in literary history was the first one to come up with, when you're analyzing anything, you need to ask yourself a number of questions, such as who, what, when, why, where, to what extent. Whenever you come to something, you ask those questions or you are misapplying it. And of course, Paul doesn't want anybody misapplying here. It's targeted to those that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. That's the purpose of the Pentateuch, of the law. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Power of this thing is limited. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law, legally gone, is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. There's something happened that has been predicted in the law and the prophets. The law is uh, on its way out and there's something going to replace it. Even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith in Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. It was pretty much for the Jews before, but it's been expanded now to all, to everyone, universally. Everybody has a shot. Sorry, John Calvin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So it shows where you have missed the mark. It shows as you put your life up against the law, you came up short. John Lennon, when exposed to this, said, well, if that's true, I guess that means me. Well, John, you were right that time. You were wrong most of the time when you're writing your songs, for instance, but you were right that time. It means you and everybody else. All right, the purpose of the Pentateuch, to establish guilt. Secondly, to instruct and provide hope for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. That's why you've got it. Romans 15, four, to provide examples and admonition, 1 Corinthians 10, six. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things. As also, as they also lusted. Now they, they messed up in the Old Testament. And they went down alleys they shouldn't have gone down. And they lusted. And this is to show you that it doesn't come out very well when you do that. If you just give your mind even, just free vent to roam anywhere it wants to, you're gonna wind up with lust and the Pentateuch then can be a purifying influence and a warning. And then next, to foreshadow the future. Hebrews chapter 10 verse one to foreshadow the future. For the law having a shadow, what is a shadow? It's something you can pass through and not really realize you're passing through it if you're not careful. It is an outline. It is an indicator. It is something that is not fleshed out as yet. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, not fleshed out, not corporeal as yet. It's a promise 
that will be fulfilled and fleshed out later on can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. You have to keep coming back if it's the law. Every year you got to re-up. And if you don't, you've messed up. You don't want to die in that condition. Imperfect repetition. You are staying in the game when you do that by your obedience. But that's the best that can be offered. You're staying in the game. It's not permanent. And then finally, uh, to unveil, to unveil, reveal Jesus in the Old Covenant. To reveal Jesus in the Old Covenant. Luke chapter 24. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about threescore furlongs. That would be about seven and a half miles. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together in reason, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. My guess is he was with them most of the trip. It doesn't say all the way from Jerusalem, but he was with them most of the trip. But their eyes were holden. Now whether this was supernatural or not, probably was somewhat. They didn't recognize him. They're his followers, but they don't recognize him. That they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? What's the matter with you boys? You look like you lost your best friend. And one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answered and said unto him, Art thou a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known these things which are come to pass there in these days? I mean, what planet have you been on, stranger? You don't even know what happened? The whole place is shaken up. And he said unto them, What things? Jesus is playing a cat and mouse with them here. What things? And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet. Well, they got it one third right. He's a prophet, priest, and king. But he was a prophet. They didn't even realize that he was God yet, apparently. They just knew that he was a mighty guy and he was connected. Mighty indeed before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. They're looking for a deliverer from Rome. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they had found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not, he had disappeared. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. All this is predicted and all these folks had practically memorized the Old Testament. And when they found not his body saying they'd also seen a vision of angels and certain of them which went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women said but they saw him not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart, to believe all the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? I mean, it was predicted in the Old Testament. Haven't you boys read Isaiah? And to enter into his glory, he had to go through this to fulfill his destiny and, 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 and enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Jesus was under the misconception that Moses was the author of the Pentateuch. 
Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then they see him and they realize who he is and he vanishes out of their sight. All right, what an opportunity. 7.5 miles. I think uh, if, if you have any of the material that was handed out, a little bit of a misprint here. Let's say it's uh, 10 minutes a mile. Now probably they were going slower than that because they're carrying on this conversation and they're being taught and scripture's being quoted. But if it's 10 minutes a mile, that's an hour and a half Bible study with God. Now what would you give for that? God as the professor. And while the lecture was going on or whatever, they didn't have a clue who the professor was. And if they had known, they wouldn't have known the full credentials of the professor. What an opportunity. And then and there is the uniqueness of the contents of the Pentateuch and the rest of the Bible. Suppose it was made up by these men. Suppose Metzger's right. And some men got together and this one tweaked it and that one tweaked it. Got down to the priests and then they said, well, let's put it into a final form. Man would not tell history, which is actually his story. Man would not tell it and tell on man the way God directs the writers to tell it. Because it exposes wickedness and the, the filthy sin of men and of man and of individual men. And not only individual men, of the writers, of the writer Moses. Someone said we are taught God's law from a murderer. From a murderer. Well, who's the murderer? Moses. We are taught worship from an adulterer. Here's how you worship. Now, I know I messed up, but I had an affair with this woman. We're taught worship from an adulterer named who? David. We're taught God's sovereignty and possible serenity from a sufferer named Job. And we're taught God's grace from a brawler named Peter. Genesis, of course, is the beginning of all matters. It's the beginning of time and space and the ecosystem of sin and its solution of sacrifice or offerings, of prophecy, of the decree of God or the plan of God being revealed, the introduction of Satan, the start of civilizations, of cities, of war, of nations themselves, of Israel being God's people, of dispensations, the seven or eight, depending on your view of the diff different dispensations, Edenic, Adamic, Noahic, Abrahamic, grace, tribulation, millennial kingdom, and then some would add eternity. The contrast with the book of beginnings, to really understand it, you have to go to what book? The book of endings. The book of endings, the revelation. And all of this stuff that starts in Genesis, the bow is tied on it in the book of the Revelation. So what do they do about that? Well, that doesn't belong in the, in the canon. Just take that and throw it right out of your Bible. Any good theology book will give you point by point by point by point of how the two contrast, one begins, one ends. Dr. Peter Ruckman points out that it is called the Old Testament 
because the writer of Hebrews used the term old. Let me see if I can find the passage here. I think it's 13, 813. It says this, in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Now the whole passage here, he's talking about the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's ready to vanish away. Usher's date for this is 35. So the old hadn't totally transitioned out, but it's getting pretty much along the way here at this point. And Hebrews itself is a transitional book. All right. Now he uses this old in contradistinction to the new covenant. According to Jesus Christ, the old is to be divided into the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, Luke 24, 44. In the Hebrew Bible, the divisions are the Torah, the Nabhim, the Kethubim, and the Kethubim, of course, is part of the Pentateuch. You say, why well, not just call it Pentateuch? Pentateuch is a Greek term. And those are the divisions given by the Lord, the Torah, the Nebhim, and the Kethubim. The book of Genesis, as we go through, will have 50 chapters, and that makes it an excellent year's study, and a lot of preachers do that. You take a week off for Easter and a week off for Christmas, and vole, you've got a chapter a week to move through. You're not going to move through very deeply in a chapter a week, but it does work out mathematically. 50 chapters, 1,533 verses, 38,262 words, all of which we're going to treat as if they are inspired, God-breathed, theopneustos, authored by God, and belong to be included every single verse. That's how we're going to approach it. Now, we don't care if it is challenged by the puny intellect of sinful brain-damaged men. We're not going to accept that. We're just going to accept it as it appears in a King James Bible. All right, let's now move to the narrative where I would have liked to have started. The text, raw scripture, something you can chew on. Much more interesting, inspiring contents is the book itself. The exposing of scripture. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning. Genesis 1.1 is a crucial verse. Now they're all crucial, I understand that, but this is a crucial, crucial verse. The liberals try to say it's not, and they question the first three chapters of Genesis. Just throw those out. Fantasy, first three chapters. Can't depend on any of that Adam and Eve stuff in that story. It makes a nice mythology, but it's not real. Well, if it is untrue, John's writing of John 3.16 is also untrue. It's just the vaporings of a fertile mind. And it pretty much just repeats what the beginning of Genesis says, the beginning of John. If it is untrue, it makes our brother John a charlatan. It makes him the purveyor of chicanery along with this little group that got together, some of them related to each other, and they decided to perpetrate this fraud on the rest of humanity. So from Galilee way they filtered down and they, uh, they started this, this hoax. 
By the time that John writes his book, his, his gospel, he's probably in his 90s. Some of the material says he was, he was about 97 AD or so when he died. He has watched at least 10 of the apostles die perpetrating the hoax. And he's willing to go all the way to the grave himself, even if he's the only one left lying about this. What a ridiculous scenario. When the other guys, all they had to do to get off was just say, okay, it's a hoax. That's all they had to do. Now you won't get very far when you're trying to date the beginning before you're confronted by those who should know better alleging that the Bible teaches a 6,000 year old earth. What are we gonna do about dating the beginning? The answer is verses two through 20 are possibly a recreation and this was for centuries the traditional conservative view. It does indicate, I believe, that man hasn't been here much longer than 6,000 years. And when you're dealing with a God who always was a mind-boggling truth, it boggles my mind. Did you ever try to wrap your mind around something that always was? Don't try. All it'll do is give you a headache. Something that always was. But if you have a God who always was, that means time goes back far enough for anything to happen. What's gonna happen in heaven? Everything. Well, well, why will everything happen in heaven? Because it doesn't end and everything that can possibly happen will happen. You go back the other way and it's the same truth. And once you grasp that, you have, we may have been here, or the earth may have been here, not the earth, but the solar system, the galaxy, eternity, may have been here 500 million years, if the gap theorists are right, before God somehow saw fit to begin the recreation process. In that interval, you have all the time necessary for geological ages, fossilization, dinosaurs, and whatever else the scientists dream up. Now I know Ken Ham just had a spasm. He just had a heart attack when I said that. All of his young earthers hate gapsters. <laughs> they don't like the gap. They say it doesn't belong, that the whole shooting match has only been here 7,000 years or so going on, 6,000. Some of them will admit that, okay, maybe man has been here around 10,000 years, but that messes up the chronologies. And we'll maybe discuss some of that later on. We don't have time to get into it today. I've only got 16 weeks. But we will admit that things have changed, haven't they? Things have changed. Used to be everybody believed the book. Used to be everybody could accept in the beginning God. In the beginning God. But if you accept in the beginning God, You're going to do away with a lot of man's philosophy. That's the problem. If you do in the beginning God and really believe it, and Americans used to, well, that does away with Darwinism. Well, that's about three quarters of the high school curriculum. And atheism, and agnosticism, and pantheism and humanism, and modernism, and materialism, and naturalism, and fatalism, 
and Unitarianism and rationalism and existentialism and idealism and uniformitarianism and come up with another 30 isms and you get the same result. In the beginning God, in the beginning God, four words. And on those four words hinges what is called your worldview. What is your worldview? Well, can you say in the beginning God? Now that logically pinpoints what you believe where you are, your worldview. And the greater percentage of Americans who deny God, the more pagan and hellish America will become and is becoming. Just look at the news. The bottom line, it's a potent verse. Is it any wonder that so many have attempted to use the penknife of philosophy to explain it away? David couldn't have been more literally incisive when he cried, Thy word is true from the beginning. Psalm 119, 160. From the beginning. In the beginning, the Greeks and universalists who taught the universality of matter, as well as the moderns who adhere to uniformitarianism, have just been dumped in 13. If God is real, it had a beginning. And it will have an ending. God, the real force, may the force be with you. Well, I hope the real force is with you. He is the initiator, the planner, the generator, the power. And one of his names means literally power. There goes atheism, which ushered Marx, Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, and Hitler straight to hell. Note also the singularity of the noun God. Actually, it's a uniplural noun, but it is also a singular noun, which a allows the Jews to be considered to be monotheistic. That is, they believe in one God. And they messed up there for a while. But when they went into captivity and came out, they came out chanting in unison, the Lord our God is one God. The Lord our God is one God. The Lord our God is one God. And they still say it today. So, exit the pantheon of deities of Babylon, Greek, Hindu, and Chinese mythology. Some did and do exist. Demonology, and also check out the book of the Revelation. But they are not gods, capital G, but sons of God. Sons of God. They're real. They're real. They'll show up again, according to the book of the Revelation. Men will assume that they come from another planet. Maybe some of them will, but uh, I just tend to think that a lot of them will come up from under the earth as well. God created, you shift the emphasis. If this is true, and it is, Spencer, Darwin, Huxley, Darrow, 98% of the college professors of any discipline, 90% of the high school teachers of any subject, it's taught in all and the majority of the population of Europe and America, starting in 1859 in the publishing of Charlie's book, have followed the false philosophy of evolution straight to hell. Someone says, well, what about theistic evolutionists? You know, the God uh, directed it all. Can they be saved? It is perhaps not a theological impossibility. I've known one personally that I thought was saved and think is saved, but it wouldn't be true in one case out of a thousand. You see the creation that God engaged in was not directed and slow. It was immediate and out of nothing. Out of nothing. Hebrew bara. 
Dex Nihilo. Nothing has a problem evolving. Now think about it. Another one of those mind benders. I was in a debate one time with a guy and he was trying to convince me that it was all slowly formulated and everything. And I said, yeah, but, but the Hebrew word is out of nothing. He said, huh? An SMS professor. I said, define nothing for me. Just define it. And he said, uh, well, that's kind of hard. Yeah. It's kind of hard to do anything with nothing, too, unless you're God. The impossibility of nothing evolving into something is enough to stop an evolutionist in his tracks. God created the heaven and the earth. Unity, Unitarianism, Brahmanism, Christian science, all forms of pantheists bite the dust and find out that the dust isn't God or the lice in the dust. They're not God. Nature, you want to worship God in nature? Go out there to the seashore during a typhoon or a hurricane sometime and worship God in nature. Nature's cursed. Nature groans. Nature travails. And nature and nature's God are separate entities because nature wasn't always. God was always. What happened in America? When my grandfather was, was born, he used to go calling with his father who was a preacher, Eben Vick. And they would talk. And he says that they were out one time and Dr. Vick, then a young child, asked his dad, how many people in this county don't believe in God? And folks knew everybody in the county at that time. It's really weird. And he said two. Two people in a county in Kentucky don't believe in God. Dr. Bob Sr. at Bob Jones University reared in Alabama. He said in chapel one time there was one person in the county that didn't believe in God. One. Among the founders of our country there was one and a half Tom Paine, and if you catch Jefferson on a bad day, you could question him as well. What changed it? About half now don't believe in God among our fellow Americans. Where, when was the tipping point? I want you to project back to the 1920s in Tennessee. July of 1925. It was a scorching hot summer, around 100 degrees. Now remember, this is before air conditioning. And a high school teacher by the name of John T. Scopes, trying to stir things up, it was a setup taught against the law of Tennessee evolution in his biology classroom. He was arrested. There was a trial. The trial turned into a circus. People flooded into Dayton, Tennessee. Famous evangelists and Bible teachers and skeptics followers. My history book shows a string of 
stands out in front of the courthouse with people milling around where people were, or the folks in the stands were selling their wares, hawking their wares. And in my history book, there's a picture of this, and one right in the middle said T.T. Martin. He had a stand set up there. And that was interesting to me because he was an evangelist and my grandmother was saved under T.T. Martin. I couldn't believe it. There it was in my history book. Thousands daily milled around the courthouse, most rooting for the prosecuting attorney, a man by the name of William Jennings Bryan. Is he up there? Okay, there he is on your right. William Jennings Bryan. He was opposed by the defense attorney, a man by the name of Clarence Darrow. Clarence Darrow was the most famous lawyer in America in his day. He was the Johnny Cochran or F. Lee Bailey of his day. Now, I'd love to go into the details of this. I, I wrote a paper on it one time in graduate school, but the thing turned into a theological debate that should not even have been entertained. The question was, did he break the law or not? Not what were the days of Genesis? Were they eons of time or were they literal 24 hour periods? Things like that were debated. By the way, uh, Clarence Darrell, he had a nickname, Mouthpiece of the Mafia. That's a colorful nickname, isn't it? Mouthpiece of the Mafia. Technically, Brian won the case, proving the existing law was broken. But it was brutally hot, around 100 degrees, hotly contested. Darrow realized that Brian was hurting, and so he just pressed him and pressed him and pressed him. Sometimes in the sun, they moved it outdoors so more people could observe it. William Jennings Bryan, how many of you know who he is? You heard of him before. He ran for president of the United States three times. So everybody should know him. He was so exhausted, he died the day after the trial ended. It was the tipping point in the evolution versus creationist struggle in America. It was the ushering in to the educational system of the idea that we can present evolution alongside creationism for fair play. We deserve a place at the table. Now what happened? When they got to the table, they kicked the creationists out of the table and said, you can't play ball anymore. You can't sit at the table with us. Now they're trying to get back in today under the title of intelligent design. Can't say God. But you know, you look up there, it does kind of look like it was designed by something. Will you let us say that? Once in a while they even win, but it's a slow, slow process. Bill Nye, the science guy. In the last, uh, oh, couple of months, he's come out with an article. He says he's pushing the idea that if a parent teaches his children creationism, he is guilty of child abuse, and the child should be taken away from him. So in your home, if you teach your child that there is a God and he created the universe, that's child abuse. First four words of the Bible. First four words. First verse, one, one, ten words in the English. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Seven in the Hebrew. We, uh, most of us, Englishmen and women, 
coming from somewhere over there. What do we count by? We count by tens, don't we? Count by tens. Ten words. Completion. What do Hebrews count by? By sevens, don't they? Read your Bible, read the book of the Revelation. They count by sevens. Barisheth, bara, Elohim eth, Hashemayim with Heritz. Seven words, 28 letters, four times seven. If you can go that far without blowing a fuse, you'll probably wind up a saved man or woman. And I trust that describes everyone here. All right, God bless you.